France gave the world a lot of things. The revolution that changed the world, the colonialism, which wasn't a great thing though, but when I hear the word Paris, this is what comes to my mind. The French New Wave films which shook the world, including this one, which is my personal favorite, are the gigantic intellectual movements of the last century, or this monument which to many people is a symbol of Paris. Just 18 years before the Eiffel Tower was constructed, something else was happening in Paris. This is something that isn't discussed that much, but it should be. Paris is called the City of Lights, and the working class people of Paris had their light bulb moment as early as in 1871, when a group of working class people, a large group, realized they build the entire country. They build the machines, the monuments, and everything else. So they should have the right to govern themselves, self-govern, and give basic human rights and dignity to every citizen. Something that everyone totally has in the 21st century. Who dares to say otherwise? And then they established their own government in Paris. Probably the first government controlled by the working class people. They named it the Paris Commune, which went on to implement policies like the abolition of child labor, the separation of church and state, better working conditions, the remission of rent, Pretty modern and progressive ideas if you ask me. The main French government, the Third Republic, was of course not happy with the workers taking over the city and having all these rights. So they sent the troops and crushed the workers of Paris, killing close to 30,000 workers. The bloody week. The Paris Commune survived for only 70 days. 70 days of workers determining their own fate without anyone exploiting their labor. It is a story of the indomitable human spirit that would far outlive the empires, inspire intellectuals across the globe, across centuries, and influence those who, regardless of how cliche it sounds, genuinely want to change the world. This is modern day France, but we need to go back to the France of 1871. I mean, we have to go back further to the 18th century when something really, really big was happening in Europe. The Industrial Revolution. Machines marked the beginning of a new age. To quote from the famous historian Eric Hobsbawm, the gods and kings of the past were powerless before the businessmen and steam engines of the present. Britain was probably the first place to catch this new train of possibilities. But it was this guy, a French diplomat, who used the term industrial revolution for the first time in history. The effects of the industrial revolution were not fully felt in France at that time. But something equally big was being allowed by the material conditions of the time. The much fabled French Revolution. With the slogan of liberty, equality, fraternity, the French Revolution was the harbinger of political liberty, not economic liberty. Then again, the French Revolution liberated the individual from the clutches of monarchy. Constitutional monarchies will still remain, but this was arguably the beginning. It declared the civil rights of citizens which would ultimately imbibe the values of the Enlightenment. The Industrial Revolution became the material backbone of the century approaching, while the French Revolution became its ideological equivalent. The French tricolor became so influential that many sister republics adopted the same style. But the new France would be plagued by political chaos for years and years. And a few years after the revolution, Napoleon Bonaparte ascended to power, to the first French empire. His rule was kind of autocratic, but technically constitutional. He continued his rule till 1814 when he gets defeated in the War of the Sixth Coalition. Another constitutional monarchy starts, which won't be uprooted until the July Revolution of 1830. Then comes the 1848 Revolution when the French Second Republic is created, holding on to the legacy of the original French Revolution. 
We can get to that, but you can understand how tumultuous this entire period was. Complete chaos. But there was one thing that remained static and bad. The condition of the workers. The Industrial Revolution was slowly shaping the society and France's population went up from 26.9 million to 36.5 million. Workers were plagued by poor health, undernourishment, long working days, child labor, sickness and accidents. The workers record book was re-established. It's a document that tracked the worker. Like, if an employer refuses to sign it, the employee cannot take up a job anywhere else. Terrible thing. Here's a physician from Nantes who narrates the condition of the working class, and it's pretty gloomy. To live, for him, is to not die. The proletarian returns home to his miserable room where the wind whistles through the cracks and after having sweated through a working day of 14 hours, he doesn't change his clothes when he returns because he has none to change into. The class distinctions were becoming clear. The silk weavers of Lyon who were called canoes they revolted not just once, but three times. The workers were revolting and failing, but the next decade would provide them with three situations which would trigger the possibility of something of a true revolution in a broad sense. The railroad building program, the bubble that was triggered by the Industrial Revolution, was slowly starting to burst in 1842. Unemployment was increasing, there was mass discontent over jobs, and the biggest of all, the crop failures. The potato blight that started the Irish famine was turning deadly, the effects of which was felt even in France, starvation, deaths, and their effects on the continent. What started as a crisis of agriculture led to food riots, increase in the price of grains, bankruptcy of small businesses. Fast forward a couple of years, a huge uprise in Paris that came to be known as the 1848 revolution. With massive participation of the working class, the constitutional monarchy ended. Alright, so the new government after the revolution would protect the working class, right? Well, a provisional government gets established and in the 11 member council, only two people representing the working class are chosen. This guy, an artisan named Albert and Louis Blanc, a socialist writer. But when I say socialist, I don't mean Marxist socialists. They were like kind of utopian socialists. That's a topic for another video. Anyway, so the first thing the new government has to tackle is unemployment. And they do this by setting up the national workshops where people would get jobs like leveling hills, repairing roads and all. And guess what? The conservatives were angry with this. The conservatives were like, you know what? These workers, they're not doing any work. They're discussing socialist ideas and wasting time. Terrible. The government also proclaimed universal male suffrage. No women yet? Come on. But as an effect of the 1848 revolution, many women's clubs would be formed. The Women's Voice and other newspapers would be run by women and they would call for reforms like the right to divorce, the equality of women before the law and of course better working conditions. The government also said, we'll restrict the workday to 10 hours in Paris and 12 in other places. Ooh, step towards workers rights, nice. They also set up a labor commission to study working conditions and all. But this was a provisional government. An official assembly was supposed to be elected. So this free and fair election where all men can vote happened in the same year. And guess what? The socialists lost the election. They got only 80 seats, barely 9% of the votes, despite representing the working class. The new conservative assembly does what it was expected to do.
It removes the only two working class representatives from the executive commission. They vote to close the national workshops in Paris. They announced that the unmarried workers would be sent from the capital to work on swamp draining projects in a very unhealthy region in Solon. And the artisans and the workers of Paris get angry. They helped elect this French Second Republic government, they helped people topple the monarchy. And now, the new government that wouldn't have been possible without their help is turning against them. Again, something that never happens in the 21st century. Never. Never. People revolted. Huge number of casualties. The presidential election is held, and this is where this guy comes in. Louis Bonaparte. Or Napoleon III a nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. His campaign is like super successful, fetching him almost 74.3% of the votes. The Democratic Socialists and the Socialists lose again. Napoleon III gets power and then he Wait, 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 when am I going to talk about the first working class government with which I started this video? Well, this is going to pave the way for it. Napoleon III gets elected in 1848 and his reign would end in 1852. But he was like, I'm gonna stay. And the others were like, what do you mean you're gonna stay? And he was like, I'm, I'm not leaving. Look, this is probably not how the conversation went. But Napoleon III was quite serious about staying in power, so he did organize a coup in 1851 and ensured he stays in power. He even went on to establish the Second French Empire. Same old, same old. By this time, the workers are exhausted. They almost had a government that cared for them. It got replaced by a monarchy kind of thing that undone a lot of things. But history gave them another chance. And this is the climax of our story. It's been quite a few years uh, since Napoleon III captured power and founded the Second Empire. The development of capitalism was going on, modern industries were getting established, industrial production doubled. So Napoleon III organized a great exhibition in 1867 to showcase the empire's prosperity to other empires. But Napoleon III's position wasn't so secure. The situation at home was terrible. Terrible for the working class. Louis Bonaparte's own leading official, Hausmann, noted that over half the population of Paris lived in poverty bordering on destitution, even after working for more than 11 hours a day. True, in the Second Empire, the average wage of the workers rose by 30%. And the cost of living? The cost of living rose by a minimum of 45%. Rents doubled one third of the wage into paying rent. Food takes up 60% of the wage. And for other stuff, less than 10%. As a result, drunkenness increased, so did child mortality. Amid all this, Louis Bonaparte gets provoked by the Prussian leader Bismarck. And Louis Bonaparte declares a war against Prussia. And this is where things get messy. So there's war and Louis Bonaparte kind of loses the war. The people of Paris viewed this as a huge opportunity. They went to Pali Bubu and forced the legislative assembly to proclaim the fall of the empire. The French Third Republic is proclaimed here at Hotel de Ville, the city hall. A provisional government of national defense, GND, is formed. But the Prussian army was still trying to besiege Paris, and Bismarck was like, We have conditions, guys. We need a huge financial payment. And also, look at this region, it's in France. Give this region to us, we need it. Fast forward, the French National Guard loses to the Prussians. And the GND, the provisional government, starts to think, we can negotiate with the Prussians. And as you can expect, the workers of Paris were not happy with this potential surrender. They revolted. A revolutionary portion of the French National Guard revolted, inspired by this guy, Blanqui, a socialist. All right, so they capture the Hotel de Ville, the city hall, of course, and set up their revolutionary government the Committee of Public Safety, led by Blanqui. The provisional government says, wait, 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 
we are going to organize elections. But while the workers are distracted by this promise, the French government violently captures the city hall and Blanqui is arrested. People demonstrate in front of the city hall. They're killed by the government and Paris finally gets surrendered to the Prussians. This is when the workers suffer a lot. There isn't enough food. There isn't enough fuel to warm their homes. The prices increased. I mean, just look at this table. It's just terrible. A lot of these workers start joining the National Guard which was residing in Paris at that time. After all, they had to defend their city. Paris was surrendered to the Prussians and the workers were keen on keeping the city to themselves. As a result, the National Guard at Paris became full of workers. The French Republic was worried. So now this guy, Adolphe Thiers, is appointed the head of the government. And who is this guy? Someone who crushed the workers movements back in 1834. The affluent middle class leaves Paris, so the city is full of workers now. Thiers understands the National Guard at Paris is full of workers. So he sends the regular army to seize the weapons from these national guards. And this is where magic happens. When regular soldiers get there, they are surrounded by working class people. The women did not wait for the men. They surrounded the machine guns saying, this is shameful, what are you doing? Long story short, the soldiers refused to obey the general, they refused to open fire at the people. True working class solidarity. So this is 18th March 1871, Thiers and his government left Paris. Paris is now in control of the workers. And this is where they have their light bulb moment. Wait a second, why don't we govern ourselves? So in the next few days, the workers elected their own government, the commune. All the males voted for their choice of candidates. Yes, 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 I know. How is this progressive if the women can't even vote? Well, it was 1871 and they were the products of their time. The tradition of all dead generations weighs like a nightmare on the brains of the living. But women were pretty active in politics. There were women's clubs. Anyway, the elected officials were nothing like the affluent politicians. Their wages were like the average wage of a skilled worker. The Paris Commune is now formed by the communards. In the next few days, remarkable things happened. Night work is banned at the bakeries, stopping exploitation. Imposing fines on workers is banned. The factories or, or shops which were deserted by their owners who fled the city. Well, those were distributed to the workers of Paris so that they could run them. Pensions. They provided pensions to the widows. Announced free education for children. Stopped the collection of debts incurred during the siege. And they announced there will be no eviction for non-payment of rent. They also decided to limit working hours. Everyone deserves basic human rights and dignity. Oh, by the way, a German worker was appointed as the Minister of Labor. Think about this. This is 1871 and a worker from Germany is getting appointed as a minister in the government run by the working class in Paris. They even destroyed the relics of imperial times, monuments that represented the anti-worker governments. But to Thiers, the head of the republic, this all was not cool. Thiers was like, these workers have committed the biggest sin, trying to give basic human rights and dignity and justice to every citizen? We don't do that here! And the others were like, yeah, we don't. This is 1871, we must remain regressive. I mean, just look at the policies. This is 1871 and they implemented all these isolated in a city surrounded by imperial powers. This was pretty incredible. They were also keen on the separation of church and state and they abolished the guillotine. Look at this. They're literally burning the guillotine and they're apparently enjoying it. 
nice. But the workers had a fatal flaw. They organized their own forces, but they simply lacked the tactics. And I think they were reluctant to be aggressive enough to defend their city from attacks from outside. Well, that's what these communards procrastinated on. So after that, the workers became victorious. They established a workers paradise throughout the world. The Paris Commune became a world commune. But that happened in another universe. So what happened in this universe is pretty sad. Thiers send the army. The army surrounds Paris. Thirty thousand people were killed, including children. Estimates often claim the number to be twenty thousand, but many people were cremated or buried temporarily at different places. Thirty thousand people killed in a week, May twenty second to May twenty eighth, the bloody week. Think about this for a moment. The people who built the city are thrown away from existence just because of ensuring their existence would have basic human rights like food, education, shelter. A story of the government crushing down workers. We talk a lot about equality, political equality, but the French Revolution preceded the Paris Commune by close to a hundred years. But its ideas of liberty, freedom, and all those things were clearly not enough to resist the ruling class from crushing the world's probably the first working class government. It all begs the question: What is the point of equality if it can't stop one class from appropriating? Creating and stealing the labor from another. Paris Commune failed. It survived a mere 71 days, but influenced others who would carry on the legacy. There will be mistakes. There will be uncomfortable mistakes. But capitalism too keeps on repeating mistakes again and again. A new idea, despite all its mistakes, seeks to expand freedom to all aspects of life. Food, shelter, clothes. Healthcare, education, and ultimately, speech, expression. After all, freedom is merely privilege extended unless enjoyed by one and all. All right. Thank you. See you in the next video.